And now, the top rated and most listened to sibling podcast about theme parks that drops on a Thursday from the state of New York, Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz, brought to you by Dillo'sDizResort.com. Now is the time... Forever? Hashtag always MGM. Old, old, old. The secret staircase. We always do that. You are approaching the unloading area. Behold the majesty of the Sistine Seal. For the kids. A salute to all theme parks, but mostly Walt Disney. Ha! What a cute ending. Aloha and welcome aboard. This is Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz. She is Jen. Hello. And I am Frank, and we have a guest this week, Jen. How excited are you? Very excited. You know, More uh, excited than I'm letting on. Cool. <laughs> you keeping it cool? Yeah, yeah I don't want to fangirl, so I got to be cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, we're, we're big on the nostalgia. Yeah. And, you know, there's some people that we, we see over and over in different TV shows, and, and it feels like over time that we know them. Yeah. So this guest today, we and we feel like we know him, and we were talking to him before we started, and we're like, oh, we totally know him. But but April 30th on Disney Plus, Adventures in Wonderland is finally streaming. And that was big news in the month of March. And yeah. we have today a member of the cast, but we're going to talk about everything. We're going to talk about it all. Please <laughs> welcome to Theme Park Thursday, Wesley Man. Wesley, hello. Hello. <laughs> Perfect. Hello. We are so excited <laughs> to have you here. How has the past 12 months been going for you? Uh, maybe a little better now. You're hearing about Adventures in Wonderland streaming. Come on. It's oh, be good. oh, well, the last, <laughs> the last 12 months has been like living in an airport waiting for the next flight to arrive. <laughs> and yeah. consequently, I have a friend. Uh, we talk about, you know, how we ate. And it was like, oh, airport rules. So you, you that's just what you eat. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, I've accumulated the COVID-15, of which I am trying to walk off a tenth of a pound at a time and drinking as much water as possible <laughs> without floating away um, and putting one foot in front of the other every day. And, um, oh, gosh, you know, the thing I'm into uh, that I sort of discovered is yeah. I like period crime dramas. Oh. oh, and I like, yes, yes, I like the murder documentaries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of those guys. Mm-hmm. Like I like, I like watching the four or five hour documentaries and trying to put the puzzle pieces together because they actually hold my interest because how many times can you watch Sleepless in Seattle because it's on cable? Um, every time is the answer. <laughs> 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 Are there layers to that on Netflix? Like, you know, you see the ones pop up that like everyone's watching. And then is there some, is there like the second level and the third level where you really like there's really the obscure stuff out there? I'm, I'm not really sure beyond the most popular ones. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, the last one that I watched with any um, real interest, although I found it, I was falling asleep during it. So I would have to go back the next day and watch the previous hour. It was about this. Um, sorry. Yeah. It's individual named uh, Henry Lee Lucas, who is uh, uh, reported to be, you know, someone who killed over 300 people. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, it's a strange, strange tale. <laughs> but it filled up the time, which is what I seem to be doing and what the last year has, has really been about. Was was Tiger King the gateway stream into <laughs> all of these documents? Like, did it start there and just... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've, I've always liked documentaries as a, as a style of film, mm-hmm. but that one, I am afraid to tell you, I binged in two days. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I did it in one. Yeah. And I wasn't proud. I was like, this is silly. I'm not yeah. going to watch this whole thing. I'll watch one episode and see what all the fuss is about. And then it was over and I didn't it's, move. <laughs> you know, like any good story, it's filled with fantastic characters. Yes. <laughs> and by sure. fantastic, I mean practically unreal. Yeah, <laughs> that's fantastic. Yes, because uh, they're not necessarily wonderful. No, no, no. Yeah. Um, now, when you watch all of these documentaries, do you ever get to the point where, like, you have solved the case? Now you just got to wait it out to see if you're right or not. I mean, do you get yeah. to that point? Yeah. Yeah, there was uh, one on the Cecil Hotel, which is sort of a notorious, um, you know, hotel here in Los Angeles, and um, uh, Alyssa Pam. 
I can't remember her last name. Okay. At any rate, it was that was one that I had figured out uh, from watching the video footage that that they kept showing over and over, <laughs> over again, uh, and all the red herrings. And well, we found that the time codes didn't match, and so the, the film has been slowed down to make it look even creepier. And uh, you know, was the hatch open or was the hatch closed? It was a reported open. Yada yada yada. Um, can you tell? <laughs> no, you're all in. I love it. I love it. <laughs> this, is, this is totally the direction I expected at the beginning. I mean, keep us on our toes for the next hour here. I'm, yeah, I'm all yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. When you when you see like the streaming world, and because you have played so many different characters in your life, I mean, you're the quintessential character actor, especially all your roles on different sitcoms over the years. Do you, I mean, and you see these characters come through, whether it's Tiger King or anything else, and you just, you file it away and go, I'm just going to keep this in case I need it for this character someday. Oh, absolutely. You know, I'm a, I'm a makeup guy because I've been playing old men since I was 14 years old. And this cat, Harry Lee Lucas, he had one like dead eye and my eyes aren't straight anyway. He had one dead eye and he had um, three teeth in his head and um, he did not age well, shall we say. <laughs> um, and so that was like, oh yeah, that's, that's one for what we call the makeup morgue. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> choose one from column A, two from column B and put a face together. Mm -hmm. um, so <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely look at them um, from that perspective, and I'm also kind of gobsmacked that if you put what they did on the stage, nobody would believe it. Yeah, it's funny that you said that about the makeup morgue because just reading back and 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 going through all all of your career, that you know what really stands out to me is that you have such a recognizable face, but you know with the facial hair arrangement or a hat or the, the hair part, it's amazing how different you can look. It, it really, it really just seeing it all in one place as I was going through the interwebs. And oh, we, I was like just stunned at how, you know, chameleon like you're like in spite of the face that you have, you have this such a recognizable face. It's unbelievable. Well, thank you. That's, that's mm -hmm. really high praise because, you know, uh, growing up, I had this fantastic book. I was into horror movies when I was a kid. It was a fantastic book called Heroes of the Horrors. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of extended bios of Lon Chaney, Mm -hmm. Lon Chaney Jr., Bella Lugosi, Boris Karloff, Peter Lorre, um, all character actors who had had you know careers in that genre. But my my favorite was Lon Chaney Sr. Mm -hmm. because he was so transformative. I mean, uh, some folks know this, but you know, to play the Phantom of the Opera, he put he put fish hooks in his nose to make it turn up that way. When he was playing uh, Quasimodo, he put the membrane of a boiled egg over his eyeball. It was like, before we had contact <laughs> lenses or anything. So, you know? Yeah. So, um, and you know, now that you mention it, I often am cast to play multiple roles within one play. Mm -hmm. There was a play called, um, that I did in, uh, on Hilton Head Island called Sherlock Holmes and the Final Adventure in which I played five roles. So I was changing makeups, you know, I was a Bobby and I was a priest and I was a, I was a safe cracker and, you know, it was, it was great fun. Not great fun running up and down the stairs to that particular dressing room, <laughs> but you know, I was, I was lighter then. And more. <laughs> and you did the 39 steps too. Have you done the 39 I did steps? The 39 yeah. steps at Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. Yeah. That's all. That play is like, you know, <laughs> someday when I, when I'm, when I am, can go back to like community theater, when I'm done with, with my working life, that, uh, that is a play that I definitely, I, I, I long to do. I saw that show on the Broadway mm -hmm. um, when it had moved to a smaller theater and I was in like the third or fourth row and I rose to my feet and applauded mm -hmm. that show because it reminded me of, of my conservatory days and how we would make theater in the studio using two chairs, a ladder and a trunk, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. yeah. I just love that, that way of crafting theater. You know, the serious example of that is Our Town. Mm -hmm. You know, I uh, just love that uh, the audience's imagination, uh, you know, fills in the blanks. Um, 
which also I think features character people. <laughs> <laughs> no, t- I love that too. I love brass tacks, you know, simplicity, you know, the fantastics kind of look just, oh, you know, yeah, dream, love, you know oh, that show. That, that that's my kind of theater as well. So I think, again, that's why, you know, whenever I would see you in, in TV or film that it, you know, it's almost like you can pick up on it when you, when you see someone that you feel like, Love likes those same kind of things because of how they carry themselves. It's it, it's really um, it's always been worth it to stop if I'm flipping and you're on a rerun of a show for sure. <laughs> and this isn't even the end of the podcast yet. And, we're, <laughs> and I'm saying these things. <laughs> But you were, you wanted all, you wanted to do this since you were a kid. Yeah. I, uh, you know, when I was 10 years old and I got my first magic book and uh, then studied the Mark Wilson course in magic, sent away all the way to Hollywood for that (laughs) because I was a big fan of the magician television show with Bill Mm. Bixby. You kids are too young to remember (laughs) that. But, um, but yeah, I wanted to be a magician in Las Vegas, like Harry Blackstone or David Copperfield. And I wanted to be a member of the Magic Castle because, you know, all the all the cool cats in Hollywood at that time, like Jack Cassidy, they were all members of the, of the castle. Um, and so then, um, and I did, I, I did magic shows well up into the time I went to conservatory. Mm-hmm. And, you know, traveled with doves in a crate that a girl could appear in and all this stuff in my dad's wagoneer. And I was like, man, this is a lot of stuff. And then when I was, I think, 12 years old, I, start, I started going to children's theater and I was completely hooked. Yeah. And by the time I was 13, um, I was playing Fagin in Oliver. And when it was over, I was sweeping the stage because it was, you know, you do three months of creative dramatics and theater games and rehearsing a musical. And this was a big show. The show had 200 workhouse boys. Okay. And so I was sweeping up the stage that Sunday after our close second weekend closing. And I was like, am I just doing this to meet girls? (laughs) I don't think so because Mm -hmm. I'm really sad now that I'm going to have to wait two or three months before we can do it again and do more workshops and and work to another musical. So um, sitting down at the the dinner table, um, I announced that I knew what I wanted to do. And my mother said, Oh, what what is it? I said, well, um, no, I'm not going to tell you because I think you'll laugh at me. (laughs) And she said, no, no, really. What, What is it? I said, well, um, I want to make people laugh and I want to be on stage eight times a week and um, I want to be an actor. Yeah. And it was like, be, be, be. <laughs> oh, well, but you still want to go to a four year school so that you'll have something to fall back on, won't mm-hmm. you? And I said, I have no idea where this came from. Maybe it was the great beyond. I said, Mom, if I have something to fall back on, I will. And I think mm. that was that was true. Yeah. And I think that I proved to them how committed I was because we flash forward to the end of my high school career. At that time, I was working six days a week with the children's theater as a, an associate director. They, you know, kind of lofted me with a title. <laughs> but I was doing creative, creative dramatics and and theater games with over 500 children every week in three different programs in uh, Vallejo, my hometown, Sacramento and Napa. Mm -hmm. And um, I, you know, just, I I loved it so much. And um, I tried to get into uh, PCPA's summer program a couple of times and that didn't happen. But eventually after, let's see, three years of, um, the Post Playhouse at Fort Robinson, Nebraska, which was my very first professional gig when I was <laughs> 17, $60 a week and, mm-hmm. you know, a place to live. Communal living with a bunch of college students. Well, of course. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> 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 uh, yeah. Great, great days. And doing silly uh, melodramas. And some of them had an oleo. And so I would do my magic act. Mm-hmm. Anywho. Then... It was one of those summers. It was one of those summers I got a, a scholarship, a fine arts scholarship to go to Shadron State College in Shadron, Nebraska. And the first semester I was there, 
I was um, initiated into Alpha Psi Omega nice. on uh, Thursday mm-hmm. um, and then asked to be the, the host of the annual banquet on Friday. And then on Saturday, I won three awards for <laughs> best lead, best supporting and best newcomer. So I was like, as I was watching the snow pile up in January, I was like, maybe this isn't a um, bowl that I'm good to swim in. Yeah. So I, I got the wheels rolling to try to get into the Pacific Conservatory of the Performing Arts, which is a place that my mentor, Alex Urban, who is uh, deceased now, he ran all of those children's theaters and, and one international one. Uh, he went to Russia, he went to New Zealand, et cetera. Um, that's, that's the conservatory that he ra- raved about because this was in the, the late 70s when that theater was doing eight shows in rep in two theaters in the summertime. It was, it was like... Amazing actors go through, went through there, like Byron Jennings and Michael Winters, and you know, um, the list goes on and on. And um, you know, Robin Williams spent a summer there. So um, that's when I got the wheels rolling, and then I, I, I called them, and they're like, "Well, you can, you can audition," uh, but. I said, what I'm working this summer, is there any way I can, uh, I'm going to miss your audition tour? And they said, just audition for us when you come out. We're not starting until October. Well, okay. So that's, that's how I got into the conservatory after spinning my wheels for a couple of years, going to junior college and hating French and yeah. <laughs> and, and macro, macro economics. Right. Was your mom proud during that time? Because you were, you were going to school. So that's what. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. She basically said, uh, you can go to school or you can get a job uh, or you can move out. (laughs) (laughs) And it was tricky because I'm 17 years old. Mm -hmm. I had my first college girlfriend that summer. Mm -hmm. And then I had to come home and finish high school. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you did uh, you mentioned the divine intervention, so to speak, on, on on the fallback line? But even just kind of these early affirmations, did, do you attribute something in your upbringing to being able to like see what was happening and go, I know how to move forward from this point? Because I, I think a lot of people struggle with that when it's like, no, this is comfortable. I want to stay here, but you were kind of like, no, I need a bigger fish tank. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I I really wanted to do it for real. Yeah be serious and get real training. Mm -hmm. I mean, a big dream was just to appear on a sitcom because I grew up loving them. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like all the Norman Lear shows that are having sort of a resurgence now, like people don't even know how progressive all in the family was. Mm -hmm. I mean, that people drop their jaws with scenes with the Jeffersons. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sherman Hemsley, who I subsequently got to work with, <laughs> and who sent me a Christmas card. Nice. I'm glad. So, yeah, I, all of them. Barney Miller, uh, yeah. uh, Welcome Back Cotter. I used to do those impersonations, um, Happy Days. So I always, I mean, that's why I made that particular move. I didn't want to fart around with it. I didn't want to go to a four-year school. Not that there's anything wrong with that. <laughs> Many people have MFAs. I have, I have an MFA. <laughs> you know, you just did. Did he email you about this? <laughs> no, he I didn't finds email. A way him. to just wiggle this into every episode that he's got an MFA. It's so <laughs> great. I have a BFA, so whatever. I mean, come on. <laughs> My MFA is in dramaturgy. To be fair, it's not. That's not even a real thing. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Yeah, I saw a cartoon uh, that was of a bunch of guys working in a diner and there's a guy standing there and he's like, what are you looking at? We all have MFAs. (laughs) (laughs) Thus ends the MFA references on Theme Park Thursday. Thank goodness. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to go right at it. And you know what? Something that led to that, there was two things, actually. I saw the first national tour of A Chorus Line because we went as children's theater to see it. (laughs) And the the lady playing Cassie, she said, just do it. I, I knew I wanted to do this. I didn't need to go to a lot of school. This is what I needed to do. Now she's speaking from a dancer's uh, point of view and that mm-hmm. career is much shorter 
Right. Yeah. You have to right. rely on your body, obviously, he's an athletic professor. Yeah. The other one was a wonderful actor named Edward Duke, who came to PCPA, he's a very British you know, champagne and rehearsals. And all that. <laughs> well, he had a, a one person show, he came in to do uh, production of Private Lives. Mm -hmm. And I was a, an assistant stage manager on that because that was part of my conservatory training. And he had, he had a one person show called Jeeves Takes Charge, which is a PG Woodhouse um, you know, character. Mm -hmm. And he was brilliant at it, just brilliant. And he took me aside and he said, you know, Wesley, when you get out of here, don't go to ACT, don't go to the Guthrie, and don't sit by the phone because it's, it won't ring for you. You've got to go out and do it wonderful advice you know for mm -hmm. a 22 year old conservatory student yeah. here here's this professional you know he was tragically one of the guys that you know passed away of aids when he was mm -hmm. like 42 years old but uh that was a little gold nugget you so know it's kind of always been so, there though everyone just going no just do it just mm -hmm. keep going keep yeah. going in, which in my past there have been angels who have said don't give up yeah. Another one. Another one was a, a gentleman named Cliff Fannin Baker, who was the founder of Arkansas Rep. Mm -hmm. I did one show down there, and he directed the production of Christmas Carol that I did at Portland Center Stage mm -hmm. a few years earlier. And I was traveling, uh, you know, through Arkansas on my way from Hilton Head Island back home, and he, he he said, "Let's have dinner." And I and I was really, I was sad. I'm like, man, I'm. I'm not getting hired and I don't know and I'm thinking about giving it up. And he simply said, Wes, don't give it up. Yeah. I mean, he I saw mean, something. In yeah, yeah, I feel, yeah, I feel like you had all the right people telling you all the right things in the right moments. It's unbelievable. Yeah, and that's, you know, one of the great gifts of being involved in the theater is you have friends, mentors like that. And what's really important is to pass that stuff along, which is what I try to do with my mentees, students, et cetera. You know, yeah. You know, and the first thing you've heard this a hundred times. If there's anything else you can do that'll make you happy, do it. Because right. yeah. it's not without its sacrifices. You know? When when you decided, because obviously now that you've mentioned your love of sitcoms, you were you were inching towards doing film work over theater, even though you were thriving in these in, in on stage. Yeah, you know. When I was at conservatory, it was my plan to move to New York City. <laughs> but New York City scared the hell out of me. Mm. Um, I thought it was expensive back in 87. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Holy moly now. Yeah. Anyway, now. Well, uh -huh. you guys are well acquainted. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, just the, yeah. the, the municipal taxes. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, what happened was... What have had happened was <laughs> I was in a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream at PCPA in which I played Puck. We did 10 performances of it uh, in Solvang under the stars and it was sold out and it was a design that was inspired by Dr. Seuss. Mm -hmm. So it was really fun and it was mm -hmm. wacky and um, you know, I got to do very silly gags with trap doors and stuff. Well, uh, it was so good that a couple of independent producers, one of which, one of whom was in the cast, um, brought it to the Westwood Playhouse, which is now the Geffen Playhouse. And we had an actual run and a lot of us got our, our equity cards with that show. So the wind blew me to Los Angeles mm -hmm. and I had no idea how lucky I was because like three or four agents wanted to meet me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then, and then a, a manager, you know, wanted to meet me. Um, so, um, and that's how I got my first agent. And then, you know, uh, I think it was, we closed our show. It had a short six week run because, you know, Shakespeare in Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That kind of a theater town. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you're at the music center at the Mark Taper, great. Because mm -hmm. we have stars in it but yeah. we had no names. Yeah. We had names in training. <laughs> I <guess. laughs> um, <laughs> and, anyway, and so like three, three months after that, when I was working with writers and artists as my 
representation. I went in and did a, a Minnesotan accent, um, and they loved it. And uh, that was my first my first television gig. And they and and, and you're, that's something you're in a scene with Betty White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, Betty White. There was another <laughs> little-known actress. I've never really heard Cheryl of her. Lisa what has she Cheryl? done? I don't yeah. know. Surely yeah. a sitcom lover like yourself would have no idea about Betty White <laughs> yeah. prior yeah. to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and and Geraldine Fitzgerald, mm -hmm. Dark yeah. Victory, man. Yeah, I didn't know who she was. Yeah, I mean, we we didn't really have an interaction, but we were in the same scene. And mm -hmm. Just. Accounts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm in a scene with Betty White and Terry Hughes, the fantastic English director who eats nothing but a banana for lunch. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, we come in, we read on Monday, I guess it was, and we said, right, that'll be good. And you're broken for the day. We just did a read through the script. This was their sixth season, I believe. Mm -hmm. And they were all earning buku bucks and they knew what they were doing. They're all veterans of television anyway. So Tuesday, um, we come in and we block and do that. I come back from lunch early and Estelle Getty, mm -hmm. Estelle Getty says, so you're back early? I said, yeah, mm -hmm, I am. I'm, I, I like being early. I heard you met with my manager. I said, oh, yes. Yes, I did. And uh, you turned them down. I said, yeah, yeah. I've been told that you don't really need a manager until you have a career to manage, right? And she said, yeah. And you didn't want to give away 15% of your livelihood. I get it. She was fantastic. I loved her. <laughs> and and uh, so then Wednesday, we do a run through for the producers and my scene goes really well. My accent and my jokes are killing. And <laughs> Betty White walks past me on the way out of the studio and she says, well, too bad you didn't get any laughs. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. Next day, nearly all my jokes were cut. Oh, no. <laughs> really? What? Yeah, it was not because she was knocking me down. <laughs> it's because in the formula of sitcoms, the regulars must be funnier than the yeah. guests. Mm -hmm. you know? Wow. With a couple of exceptions. Yeah. It was not that way on Amen. Mm -hmm. I take, I, the first episode, I played a tax guy, you know, so I was the heavy. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I got a really big laugh on my exit line, like, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and then, you know, and then slammed the door. Mm -hmm. And Sherman Hemsley got to do his thing afterward. So mm -hmm. not only did I get, get a Christmas card from Sherman Hemsley, <laughs> but they booked me on their final episode. I was wow. the man who shut down the church. He came in in a hard hat. Oh, no, yeah. Well, I forgot like, about it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was a place where they were like, yeah, let's have you back. You know, so it's it's funny. But generally speaking, you yeah. know, especially with that, you know, quadrahedron of powerful women, yeah. there's not enough room really for the other folks to have the jokes, you know. Yeah. And in a way, a very high compliment to you because you got so yeah. many laughs that we yeah. had to cut it all out. So. Yeah. <laughs> that was absolutely her intention. By yeah. you know, <laughs> giving me the needle a little bit, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Wow. That but so many, but so many sitcoms, Night Court, mm -hmm. Home Improvement. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and just to speak to that sitcom lover in you again, do, do you did you continue while you were appearing on some to like really get into the sitcoms of the time and like how does the absorption of seeing what what's funny for the times and what's not yeah i mean family matters mm -hmm. and someone posted a picture of me as mr lawler from uh that's so raven mm -hmm. who was the spitting principal they, they posted it on twitter with a caption that said this guy would spread covid um <laughs> someone brought that to my attention this week like <laughs> Look, I'm famous with the kids. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't watch sitcoms as much as I used to, but I have very fond memories of being in them. I mean, I, maybe I don't watch them because I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> um, you mentioned Night Court. That was one of the most fun evenings of my life, followed mm -hmm. by another one that I'll tell you about in a minute. So... <sighs> I'm doing this slow guy. Well, 
let's start with the audition. I would go in and this is like the fabulous April Webster was the casting director on this. And she had kept having me back for these different roles on night court because they had a lot of guests. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. And I sat in the, just outside the casting office in a waiting room and I saw a piece of paper on the table there. And it was a list of actors the producers like. Guess whose name was on it? <laughs> <laughs> so I went in, I auditioned for this slow motion guy who was tortoise nervoso. And I did my best Tim Conway impersonation. Mm. <laughs> I learned so much about physical comedy from that clown. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I, I, just, I just idolized him. Anyway, so I did that and they, they, you know, they hired me. And then the bit that I did on the show was just killing, you know, Harry Anderson was a really nice guy. We were both magicians. That mm -hmm. was really cool. Yeah. Um, Lara Kett kind of kept to himself. And Richard Mall, I worked with subsequently a couple of times too, a really good bloke. And anyway, the bit was was absolutely killing. And I I really had to keep a straight face. And I did. And that was awesome. And I felt like I <laughs> nailed it. And, and it was the sixth season rap episode, and they had 20 some other guests. But what what was awesome is the one of the crew guys came over to me and he said, You killed that. That's the only <laughs> time I've seen John Larroquette sweat. <laughs> <laughs> nice that's awesome <laughs> yeah the, the other one that's in most in my memory now is because it's the last sitcom job i did before all of this happened it was a uh an episode of two broke girls mm -hmm. and i was playing a, a snotty major d you know who was a gay rumba champion <laughs> and uh, so many characters um, <laughs> So we did, our, we did my first scene, it went okay, and we moved on. And then we did the second scene that I had. And um, Michael Patrick King, who is the show creator, you know, mm -hmm. Sex in the City. Mm -hmm. This guy's a, 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 a king of television. Yeah. He, he stops and he gathers all the writers around for about 20 minutes. And then, then he asks the cast to come here. And he says something like, Wes, when she says this, I want you to say this. When she says that, I want you to say that. When she says this, I want you to do this. And when she says this, I want you to say that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I haven't seen these written down. I, I have, I've heard them out of your mouth once, but yeah. I'm following you. Roll, speed, marker, action. First joke, kills. Second joke goes very well. It doesn't kill as much because we're on a, a routine now. Mm -hmm. Third one does very well and the fourth one does very well it was the most exhilarating thing ever because it was like improvising about around a situation that you know yeah. right and it was yummy and the <laughs> audience loved it and that was cool yeah. so after the curtain call these shows have curtain calls and they bring you out mm -hmm. uh michael comes over and gives me a hug and he's i said man that was awesome you like you like doubled my role <laughs> he said no, no, and you should know this. You doubled your role. Mm -hmm. And I was like, That's still nice. big chills. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah. Like you're good enough. Mm -hmm. You're smart enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they, they, you, be, you, belong, you belong doing what you do. Yeah. See, exactly. that's another milepost in this you know, career that I've been lucky enough to have. Yeah. The, the, the validation. You know. And then throughout all the sitcoms, you're still weaving in theater, right? Along the way? That, yeah. If, yeah. If you're going to do a camera medium, that's the one I like because yeah. there's a live audience and yeah. it's organic and in the moment. And, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Yeah. I really love it. Don't get me wrong. I love being in movies and I love, what I really love is, is going to work in uh, more than one day in a row. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the crew yeah. gets to know you. I've always liked the crew and I have some friends who work on crews and, and yeah. uh, you know, in the theater, you have that sort of, <laughs> I call it a temporary surrogate family where you're, you're all trying to achieve a common goal and you're a teammates and you care about what's going on in their lives and you're really mm -hmm. close friends. You're, you're intimate friends yeah. for a short time. And once that's over, that group never comes together exactly that way again. Yeah. But you may get to work with people, you know, more than once. Right. You know, 
that was one of the gifts of working at the Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. It was a, a pretty core company there for about 10 years or so uh, that I was fortunate enough to be a part of. A good, a good friend of mine who I've worked with in the past, she's now a teaching artist up at, at Hudson Valley Shakespeare Festival. And she always used to go on about, you know, Malvolio and, and just the roles you played over time of, of the roles you did there and probably other Shakespeare roles you've done elsewhere. What's still on your Shakespeare to-do list? Uh, Lear is fast approaching. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hence all this. <laughs> um, John Falstaff mm. was approaching during COVID-19. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to, to put John Falstaff away for a while. Mm-hmm. I mean, I played him in a, in a playlet version when I was in conservatory, but I needed a big tummy and right. bird seed to do it. <laughs> I'd prefer to do it that way. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if Tom <laughs> Hanks could do it that way, Kevin Klein could do it that way. <laughs> right. I'll do it that way too. <laughs> um, and live to do it. Um, but those are two. I always wanted to uh, play Richard III because every character comic mm. man wants to play Richard III. Yeah. Because um, it's one of the few leads that a, a real character can play. And mm-hmm. I am very um, history challenged, like I've never been in Henry, uh, any of the Henry plays. Um, mm. You know, I had a lofty goal to do all 29 plays in the canon uh, yes. but I've only done 17 of them so far with uh, with some repeats like three twelfth nights and a couple of midsummers and uh, a couple of versions of Romeo and Juliet one of which I did this last year uh, with some friends of mine in Las Vegas uh, performing arts high school that because of COVID had been shut mm-hmm. down so uh, my my friend Kelly uh, said I, I we zoom occasionally I say well what's up what are you doing because she's an arts educator and she said well I'm going to do this production of Romeo and Juliet and we're going to put it on Instagram I said do you need a fryer mm-hmm. said, oh my god if I could get you let me, let me get back to you on that so that's what, what we did we we experimented with zoom and iPhones and all of that so it's it, it was all produced on Instagram and yeah. uh, it was great having a chance to mentor high school students on Shakespeare text and all of that good stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, I'd like to play the friar again. He's, mm-hmm. he's got a lot of great words and sentiments. Yeah. Twelfth Night, is it possible that you have played Malvolio, Aguicic, Toby Belch and Festi? Because I could see you doing all four of those roles. <laughs> <laughs> Only two out of the four. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Festi, Festi at ACT in like 91, I think it was, and then Malvolio at uh, at uh, Hudson Valley. But I did yeah. another uh, production uh, at A Noise Within down here in which I played uh, Valentine and Fabian, oh, right. which is usually yeah. squashed up in, in Festi. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. But in, in the course of casting that, at one point, they were trying to figure out where to put me. So uh, initially I was the sea captain. This is Illyria lady at the top of the show. And then, <laughs> then they had me reading for Antonio, which I was totally not right for. And then I came in to rehearse Antonio and they were like, wait a minute, there's somebody in there. It was somebody reading for Antonio. So <laughs> that's when they said, I'm a Valentine and Fabian. Um, <laughs> okay. I just wanted to be in a show. Yeah. Yeah. That was in 2004. It's it's nice to hear you tell this stories of, of being New York too because you, you I mean granted it's it's two hours north of this city but since New York scared you a little bit and because you were you know raised in California and you drifted back to LA and everything else it's super fascinating to hear your time in Orlando now <laughs> doing oh. adventures in Wonderland because here it's such West Coast West Coast and East Coast not New York oh, Orlando. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Orlando. <laughs> yes, yes. Well, where do I begin? <laughs> where where does it begin? How do you even have time by the way for Orlando in the midst of all of this? I mean <laughs> <laughs> Well, when you get oh that big Disney money. Um, <laughs> uh, time for everything. Uh, yeah, we we all were trying to figure out how to get our cars there. Because, you know, uh, Rick decided he was going to rent cars there because it cost like, at that time it cost like, I don't know, 
couple of grand to put your car on a truck yeah. and mm-hmm. take it across the country. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. What happened was um, my friend Patrick had a little white Miata at that time, and it was the last one to load. Um, and, you know, it takes a, over a week for the car to get there. Yeah. Well, the driver broke down okay. and he drove Patrick's car to get help. <laughs> I don't recommend. <laughs> Eventually we all arrived and we all got, got situated in our apartments and um, we had like a 25 minute drive to um, the MGM studios. And we still um, call it MGM, by yeah, the way. So feel it. free to just keep calling it that. Yeah. Just call it MGM? Yeah, yeah we, just, we, we, we call it it. We haven't changed the name in our heads, so it's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to know some folks still remember <laughs> the old days. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So um, I thought Orlando would have winter, but it didn't. So I spent money on clothes that I couldn't wear. Um, the thing about my particular character was that because my, of my makeup and because it required two other puppeteers to be me, they tried to shoot me out in one day. Mm-hmm. So I went in for the readings on Monday. We read, we read two scripts because we did two episodes a week. And then um, I would go in maybe Thursday or Friday. Um, and you know, one of my days was voiceovering a clay animation cartoon while the other folks were learning songs. So one of the things about it is that that particular studio, those studios we were in, there were two of them, um, had a glass wall so that tourists could go by. That we were like, like, hey, look, hey. (laughs) So we were an attraction as well as a TV show. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they couldn't hear us, which is probably a good thing (laughs) because invariably I would start going, "Mm, mm, mm, mm," saying, you know, the cattle are here. And uh, so don't do anything lewd because the temptation is so strong when you're doing children's television. Everything that you do has to pass standards and practices. So you cannot improvise, you can't go blue, you can't do anything like that, which is part of, I don't know, the world of acting when you're an adult. (laughs) (laughs) But acting when you're a caterpillar is different. So that was awesome. So I I didn't work uh, as many days as the other guys. The point I'm getting to is that I hung out in the makeup trailer. I mm-hmm. hung out in the makeup room and I learned how to ventilate hair pieces. By ventilating, I mean tying individual hairs onto netting and making eyebrows, sideburns, mustaches, etc. All right. Um, yeah. Ron Wilde was uh, an amazing uh, makeup artist and designed mm-hmm. all the makeups on the show. Um, wow. And at that time, he was uh, living in Las Vegas and designing makeups for Excalibur and a bunch of other places. Mm-hmm. Um, but fantastic work with latex and Pax Paint and all of that stuff back then. Yeah, it was just the best place to hang out. the The makeup and hair people are some of the coolest people on a set, mm-hmm. especially the makeup people, and well, I guess the hair people too, because they have to invade your personal space. Mm-hmm. Right. So you have to trust them, mm-hmm. and they're great. Yeah. I just love hanging with them because I love their craft too. Like, like for instance, vent- ventilating. I had never seen one of these amazing magnifying glasses with a ring light around it. So you could look through it and not have to wear spectacles and tie hair, you know. (laughs) It's just like doing a latch hook, right? by the way, in case case you want to take it up. Yeah, I don't think, I mean, I could, but (laughs) I mean, maybe do some research. (laughs) (laughs) It's almost been 10 years. So so, (laughs) so that's how I would feel some of my time. Mm -hmm. The rest of my time, I would feel going out the back door of the studio, right onto the lot, to the, Mm -hmm. to the, to the theme park. Yeah. On stage. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> park. And I would see, you know, if it was in the afternoon, I saw a lot of pasty, sunburned, overweight <laughs> parents just slogging along because they got to get it all done in one day. And the kids are crying and they're hungry. And there's, mm-hmm. I've never seen so many strollers lined up outside mm-hmm. the studio, just like a, a platoon. And um, <laughs> so, 
where where I would go more often than not would be um, the Muppets 3D movie because mm-hmm. it was a great attraction. Oh, it yeah. really, really was, mm-hmm. and I didn't have to get on a roller coaster or anything. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it's the air conditioned yeah. Muppets can't go wrong. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not so humid. Awesome. Yeah. I also, you know, took up uh, photography at that time. I bought like Canon Rebel. It was a single reflex camera. Mm-hmm. Nobody knows what that is anymore. <laughs> <laughs> how long? How long total to get you in in the makeup? The first time before he had all of his colors mixed, it was about three hours, mm-hmm. um, and all of, all of the pieces made, and then. Yeah. The thing was, it took about an hour and a half to get out of it too, because this was uh, this was a surgical adhesive that right. he used to put these pieces on. So that's that's an adhesive that they use to close up scars. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So um, it has to have a solvent to dissolve it, which is called detach all, mm-hmm. which had kind of an acetone smell. Right. So you really had to be good about moisturizing your skin. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. De- apply the detach all wait for it to react and then start rolling it off your face in little tiny balls mm-hmm. like later mm-hmm. subsequently my skin started to break out down there really bad sort of cysts oh. and i was and i went to the locals and they said oh you're probably drinking our orange juice aren't you i said yeah man i can't get enough of it i'm just like it's like a quart a day it's like mm-hmm. yeah stop that because oh. you know it's it's highly acidic and um mm-hmm. uh, Later, I found out that, yeah, I have a, an O blood type. God, I'm telling too much on this. <laughs> no, we love it. <laughs> um, I have an O blood type, which, you know, citrus is not good for you because mm-hmm. you, already, you already have a really acidic system designed to digest meat, which I enjoy. Mm-hmm. I don't think anyway, I ever knew this. I think I want to. That's my skin up. story. Yeah. <laughs> And then there, and there was two other guys. It was two other people. There was is there one in the middle arms and then one at the bottom. That's correct. Well, yeah, yeah. And the first set of legs. Right. Yeah. So there was one that was sitting like this with the arms mm-hmm. out, and then there was one above that sat on a little stool, and he had this. And then I was leaning over a piece of PVC pipe so that I could have my arms be the same length as theirs, and I was, you know. When they figured out how how hot it would be, then they gave me a cool suit, which um, I don't know. Maybe your listeners are interested in that. <laughs> it's it's basically a vest that has aquarium tubing going up and down through the whole thing, and it has two hoses, one for in, one for out, and that's attached to basically a, you know a, a box with ice, <laughs> like a cooler. Like a cooler. Right? <laughs> coolers. Coolers. Yeah. Why is it the really important words don't come out? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Ikula. E- yes. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, that that's really good to bring your core temperature down. And, and Patrick really needed that uh, as we continued to shoot because he was really active on the roller, roller blades. Mm-hmm. Right. That's interesting. I feel like friends of the characters in the theme parks seems like something they could use. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. where it came from, actually. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Because, you know, on their brakes, they hook up. You know, yeah. The <laughs> coolers. Mm-hmm. To the coolers. To the coolers. <laughs> hook up has a whole different connotation. <laughs> was, this something... that way. <laughs> was this something brought to you that, hey, there's going to be this show in Orlando? How did it come about? Oh, my goodness. Well, um, I get this audition to uh, audition for the Mad Hatter for this series for Disney. Mm-hmm. So I went in and I said, no room, no room, no room. And they <laughs> loved it so much that they wanted me to come in for the caterpillar. <laughs> so so um, subsequently I came in and I did my caterpillar mm-hmm. and they liked it. And then I think I went in a third time to read with one of the Alice's. And then they did a screen test, which was really a makeup test uh, of just the head. Because mm-hmm. that head is a, is a piece that ends right about here, right. all made of foam latex. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Ron did a full makeup and it felt like it was getting really close. And then none of us heard anything for like three months. And then they're like, okay, we'll put you on retainer. 
for another three months. Mm -hmm. So it was like six months between the time we auditioned to the time it was time to shoot the pilot. Mm -hmm. Um, um, And so that's how it happened. It never happens like, oh, we're doing this show. You want to be in it? Right. (laughs) (laughs) Not for me. Um, Right. Yeah. Was this the same time that Mickey Mouse Club was there? Did you guys overlap in those studios or? I don't believe we did. No. Don't think so. I wasn't sure if there was a year or so. I don't remember any other shows being shot down there at that time. I may be mistaken on that though. Okay. And I know the exterior, the house was on the back lot, right? The outside of Alice's house, I think in the beginning credits. Yeah, it was. Yeah. was. That's an exterior. Yeah. The bedroom was on our set. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Adventures in Wonderland was Jen's morning cereal before school. (laughs) Oh, that's so awesome. I love (laughs) it. Some Fruit Loops and some Adventures in Wonderland before school, you know? Living life. Yeah. (laughs) Were you able to... If, if something came up, audition like uh, a role came up for you to audition for that was in California, were you allowed to do that during that time? Did you have to send tape? What was, because it was a different time. Yeah. <laughs> <just> yeah. <laughs> it wasn't really feasible for me at that time. So okay. I, I think I probably told my agent that I'm booking out to do this gig. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. And, you know, it's it's conceivable that it could have been done, but it would have, people would have had to do a lot of shuffling for it to happen. Right. And, yeah. you know, like, get people angry at you for, you know, schedules colliding. Right. And making producers compete with each other. You know? mm-hmm. And you did two a week. Was it split over the couple of years? Or would you do like 10 episodes? And then I, I don't like how, how many episodes in, 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 a, in, a, in a period of time would you shoot? I think our schedule, if I remember incorrectly, was uh, three weeks on, one week hiatus. Mm-hmm. And each each week had two episodes in it. So it was six shows, then a week off, six or okay. a week off. Yeah. You know, um, and a week off in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Back <laughs> then, <laughs> no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, went the, I went to the Strawberry Festival. I went to one Texas Rangers spring training game. There you go. Uh, what else did I do? <laughs> oh, when, one time we went down to St. Augustine. We took a road trip down there. Saw Daytona Beach and St. Mm. Augustine. And, uh, yeah. Um, and I ate some barbecue. Oh. <laughs> like when, you were, when you were out walking around the parks during your breaks, did anyone ever recognize you once the show was on the air and got a little more popular or never? Not one. Never. <laughs> <laughs> although... although some uh, people about your age, after the show had had done airing and everything, uh, have looked at me and said, <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. and then all I have to say is, hello. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of a story. <laughs> <laughs> That's really funny. No, and there was even, a, I, I think, um, our friend Tammy Tucky uh, had... Uh, footage of this it was uh they did a a stand-up of us you know on cardboard you know Mm -hmm. and me going (laughs) as i I am in all the prints slightly bemused and surprised yeah (laughs) no we're well i mean and i I know jen when i told jen last week that it was uh coming to disney plus she was like oh my gosh Mm -hmm. (laughs) we'll we'll be all about it you know and of course the cast we're all on facebook messaging each other going did you hear did you hear oh my god what what does that mean for us are we gonna have this new deal is an old deal what yeah yeah Mm -hmm. right and you know and the the main thing and i called the union i found out about it and all that stuff Mm -hmm. but but the big thing uh that I'm getting to is that when you're in this career, you get paid in a lot of different ways. Mm-hmm. You get paid with great friends, great parts, great experiences, great audiences. And in this case, you get paid in the fact that a whole nother generation is going to see your work mm-hmm. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. and maybe be their Captain Kangaroo, their, you know, uh, Miss Mary on Romper Room. They're right. like, like it was for you, the start of your day. And that's really touching. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Well, before we go, I just I, I we want to touch on Back to the Future too, just for a second, because oh, must we, we have must to, right? we yeah. have to. <laughs> you know, the way the way I look at it, you know, the original Back to the Future in some it, it's not not necessarily my favorite movie, but I see it as like a perfect movie. There's just so much about it that's perfect in my eyes. 
But what I love about Back to the Future 2 is, is how it repeats itself. And I, I am curious for you to be kind of dropped into the middle of an iconic scene, which is after George has knocked out Biff. And, and then, you know, you kind of get to see what happens after. I, I just think that's the coolest thing in the world that, you know, four years later, you're in an iconic scene of a classic movie. It was already classic by then. Yeah, I know. I know. I remember coming to Los Angeles and seeing uh, the Michael J. Fox billboard on Sunset Boulevard of him looking at his watch. <laughs> and it was a countdown to the opening of the movie. Yeah. And, uh, and I was like, wow. And, I, and I, had an, I had a lunch with Joan Scott, who was the owner of Rogers and Artists at that time. Mm -hmm. And um, after she said, you know, they can do wonderful things with teeth now. After she said that to me, uh, she was like, well, how are you? How are you going to live here? I said, well, my parents are helping me. They've always supported me through my conservatory uh, years, et cetera. And, uh, and well, um, why are you here? I said, well, I want to do television. I want to be on billboards like that. Mm -hmm. she, she, uh, that was music to her ears. <laughs> Subsequently, I got my teeth fixed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but what it was like, I mean, the actual day of shooting, um, shall we say night of shooting, was um, being called, let me back up. The audition was at Imagine Entertainment on the Universal lot. And so um, what's what was Imagine Entertainment? At that time, it was a real live log cabin set back in a <laughs> grove of palm trees. And, um, you know, the guard told me where to go. And as I approached the building, someone walked up to me and said, excuse me, may I help you? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm here for casting. <laughs> oh, yes, right this way. So I'm in a conference room that is as big as a barn and log cabin everywhere, dark wood. The conference room is, you know, an enormous tree that's been cut in half. It's one of those. And and the furniture is all this big rough hewn stuff made out of <laughs> limbs that big, all <laughs> polished and varnished and weird. And there's a video camera and the casting director comes in. And I read copy that I didn't even know. And, and, and eventually copy that was not in the motion picture. Mm -hmm. Even then they were worried about leaks. So, <laughs> um, yeah. And then I get the call that I'm, you know, you're, you're, you should be at Whittier High School at four o'clock in the afternoon. Drive out there, sit in the chair, go through the, the works. The guy cutting hair says, man, you've got a great head of hair for this period. I'm like, <laughs> just go over there and pick a suit. <laughs> it's kind of like that movie the sting when they're you know, <laughs> right, right. Man, go pick a suit <laughs> I, I found this lovely sort of striped orange number and a tie and some two-tone shoes and i was like i like it. <laughs> and then i went to my trailer and then it was midnight and it was time for lunch <laughs> <laughs> obviously <laughs> so i got my lunch and i sat down at a table across from uh uh leah uh, and and who was the nicest person ever? Mm -hmm. She sat with the extras and answered all their questions. That's awesome. Um, fantastic lady. And it's basically, my 1987 dream right there yeah. is to go to table <laughs> with Leah Thompson and have her answer all my questions. <laughs> yeah. Uh, will you love me? <laughs> will you marry me? <laughs> you look like this forever. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, and so then uh, after lunch was over, I went back to the trailer and then it was 4.30 in the morning and the sun was coming up and it's like, boom, 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 boom. we're ready for you. See, at that time in my career, I didn't know that you could nap on the set. I was all <laughs> amped up to get yeah. in front of the camera and meet Robert Zemeckis and do this thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was like this, I was wired and uh, drinking Diet Cokes and <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Um, so we do the first scene, which is, you know, pushing in on Michael and it's okay. I know CPR. What's mm -hmm. CPR? I did that whole thing. And then, you know, him, him running away and the, I think he took his wallet stuff. Mm -hmm. And then, then we did, I think he took his wallet as its own thing. And uh, Robert just ran the camera. He was going to do 11 minutes uh, without, without stopping. And, you know, it was, you know, six or seven minutes of him saying, okay, now look away. Now look back at me. Now say it. 
Okay, now look away. Look back at me. Now look away. Now look back at me and say it. So he had like a number of different choices to okay. do. Obviously, he chose the best one. <laughs> and, um, and so that was like, and cut and moving on. And that's a wrap on Wesley. Uh, <laughs> And I was kind of like, yeah, but I, uh, I, I, yeah, I uh. <laughs> it's like, it's like uh, Burt Lancaster in, in, uh, in uh, Field of Dreams. He says, mm. It's like, it's like being this close to your dream. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it is a dream because, you know, the magic of film is that, you know, a year and a half later, people are like, oh, my God, I stood up in the movie theater. That's you. <laughs> all over the country. It was great. You know, all my theater friends were like, ooh, wow. Well, mm, yeah. Yeah, it was 20 minutes with Zemeckis. <laughs> so, uh, but. But I just watched it again. We were emailing back and forth, and it was on that night on AMC. Uh, <laughs> and I was like. What's happening? <laughs> well, I guess we're at class. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. It's it's iconic and it's and it's kind of amazing that you know I play golf and guys say, "Well, what do you do?" I'm an actor. I'm like, mm -hmm. "Oh yeah, have you seen you in anything?" <laughs> That's what they always say. Yeah. But I'd love to rattle off thirty years of television credits <laughs> for you. But let me just start with this one. Oh my God, you're that guy? I said, "Yeah." I'm mean, gonna think you stole this other guy, and then you know. I don't know if you've searched YouTube, but there's a guy out there or a girl out there who has sampled it and put a backbeat to it. No. Yeah. That now I have that. Now yeah, that's yeah. exactly yeah. what's yeah. happening yeah. when this is over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's a, another guy in, in the UK who calls me the boss eyed guy because that's what, what cross eyed is over there. <laughs> um, it's the boss eyed guy. And he's got a wallet. And he, and he goes on and on. It's very funny. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I have my little niche in the cultural literacy now, uh, yeah. thanks to Robert Zemeckis and all the kids at Back to the Future. <laughs> well, and I feel like there's so many movies that are considered like cult classics. I don't know that I put Back to the Future in that category. I feel like it's just a classic. But then I feel like your line is its own like cult classic because just everyone knows that line. Everyone knows your face. Yeah. So it's like its own little thing. It seems to be, you know, I, I had a friend who used to uh, live here in Los Angeles and she brought her boyfriend to a, a local restaurant to meet me. And he said, would you sign my wallet? <laughs> I, said, yes, of course. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Of course I would. <laughs> you shady person don't sell it on you. <laughs> I trust it. That's awesome. People are generally good. Yes. Well, once this pandemic is over, what are your plan? What do you plan to do first? What are you looking forward to doing? What do you have in mind? Tell us everything. I I have some great friends um, who are industry folk, like uh, a set decorator and his girlfriend who works in a props shop, um, a film producer. Um, uh, at that time, there was an editor here. And we would we would just hang out at our local bar in in Burbank and and just you know talk about the industry and talk about what we're doing and just shoot some pool. Uh, they had great fried chicken at that bar, and you know it, it it was it was really great for me because that's that's how I socialize because I'm living alone now um, mm -hmm. and for a while. So I'd love to do that. I'd love to go have a drink at a bar have a happy hour mm -hmm. and have a happy, happy hour. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, do that. I'm looking forward to eating indoors in restaurants again. Mm -hmm. um, I still don't think we're ready. We're in a race against the, uh, the variants. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's, and of course, getting back on stage. Yeah. Uh, on stage, not wearing masks, but possibly seeing an audience filled with masks. Yeah. <laughs> which brings a new light to the classic joke. What is this, an audience or an oil painting? <laughs> because you will, you may hear, yeah, laughter behind a mask. What you're going to hear is... <laughs> <laughs> I haven't even thought about that. For sure. <laughs> yeah, can you, can you imagine staring out into a sea of different colored masks mm -hmm. and a lot of silver hair as usual. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I really, I'm looking forward to that. And I'm, I'm looking forward to getting back on a set, you know? Yeah. So, 
And, you know, auditioning from home is very convenient, yeah. you know, the setup I have. Yeah. And, you know, uh, I, but I would like to not be dependent on, on uh, you know, doing books for Audible. And, you know, I'm also uh, dubbing some movies for Netflix into English. Oh, okay. I have one of those to do on Friday. So mm -hmm. it's all very convenient, but it's yeah. without any human contact. You know what I'm really looking forward to? Uh, seeing people smile because we all look kind of menacing in these masks. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. When I'm out for my walks now during the day, I have my Ray-Bans and my black mask and my cap. And uh, so I make sure that I go, <laughs> you know, I can't see, see my eyebrows. Okay. <laughs> Are you the Unabomber? <laughs> so, yeah, looking forward to all that. I think it's amazing with the career you've had and the people you've worked with and the different roles that you've had that just talking to you for this last hour plus, you're so completely humble. Like, I, I'm not sure if that's part of your upbringing too. I mean, you've known what you wanted to do since you were a kid. You had so much support along the way. But to me, I, I mean, having the career you've had, I don't think you should be this humble. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. The The people that I have known who I, I have loved have that particular trait. Mm -hmm. Henry Winkler is one. I was mm -hmm. almost in one of his movies. John Candy was another mm -hmm. one. He always hung out on the set and riffed with the cast. Yeah. He liked my um, uh, Lou Costello impersonation. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's nice. one medal of honor I have. Yeah. Um, but... <laughs> You know, it's a craft like anything else. And no matter who you are, years after you look at your own work, you're going to say, I could have done something different or something better. So it's good to keep it all in, in perspective. I mean, it's also good to be kind. Um, you know, when people get all starstruck uh, struck, uh, talking to me, the first thing I do is ask them their name and what they do. Yeah. Because... You know, I, first of all, I don't want them to implode. And um, <laughs> and I just want to have a conversation. I am honored that you think that that much of me and anybody who, you know, tries to whisk that away. I'm sure it can get overwhelming at, at a different level, mm -hmm. but at my level, it's like a great sort of modicum of fame, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. No, I, you know, just how we've uh, interacted uh, in email and when you first came on the call and just as if we, we've, as if all three of us have spoken together before yeah. or been out before <laughs> at a happy hour before and for it to seem like, all right, we're just hanging out again. Yeah. I mean, that, that really speaks to your, your character here and the characters you've played because we as an audience we're always drawn to your characters mm -hmm. in the sitcoms okay. and movies over the years and so to see that translate here is you know it's tremendous it's, it's tremendous for me to see and again i can't thank you enough for spending the time to talk to us oh, i'm glad to do it i'm very excited about the the streaming you know yeah. that, it's, yeah. that it's actually going to happen i i hope uh, i hope that there's good response to it as as good as it as when it premiered did you know that yesterday or was it yesterday the day before was the 29th anniversary of the day we premiered oh, oh wow yeah wow. yeah that. so next year at this time would be 30 year reunion yeah. we'll be in wheelchairs um, <laughs> you know we do we make a joke here when we talk about the theme parks and everything else that 1992 because that's the year i graduated high school uh that that's like the barometer for us like we only like things before 19 like yeah. 1992 <laughs> and before we're like all in on and then yeah. anything that might have come after we have to really suss out like mm -hmm. 1992 yeah. is that benchmark yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, i'm one of those guys that thinks the 90s was 10 years ago yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't like doing the math right now. No, <laughs> no, agreed. Mm -hmm. kids graduated college. I remember when they were born. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. here we are. <laughs> Adventures in Wonderland, April thirtieth, Disney Plus, Wesley Man, As the Caterpillar. Everyone needs to stream it. Do the thing and uh, relive the glory of Adventures <laughs> in Wonderland. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Thank fun. you so much. You're welcome. Theme Park Thursday with Dillo's Diz featuring Frank Cardillo and Jen Cardillo Snyder. The theme was composed by 
Matt Harvey. The intro and the outro was performed by Lindsay Zarugian. The Dillo's Diz fact checker is Mel Dale. You can follow Dillo's Diz on Twitter, on Instagram, and on TikTok at Dillo's Diz. Dillo's with an S, Diz with a Z. You can like Dillo's Diz on Facebook, facebook.com slash Dillo's Diz. And you can subscribe to Dillo's Diz on YouTube, youtube.com slash Dillo's Diz. Is, that is where you'll find the Theme Park Thursday live stream, What's in the Attic, and the Dillo's sibling reunion with Angela Dahlgren. You can also check in as a guest to the Dillo's Diz Resort, your virtual destination for exclusive Dillo's Diz content. Membership levels on our Patreon at four different levels. Dillo's Diz Resort. Dot com. We'll see you real soon, and that real soon is next week for Theme Park Thursday with Delos Diz. The Improviser's Guide Network 2021.